Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Goddard, Director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to this Institute lecture. After the lecture, there'll be a reception to which you're all invited in Ford Hall. Today, our speaker is Enrico Bombieri. Enrico has been a professor in the School of Mathematics here at the Institute since 1977, and IBM von Neumann professor since 1984. He was born in Milan and completed his university studies there, became a professor in Pisa in 1966. He was a member here in 1973 to 74, and from 1974 he was professor at the Scuola Normale in Pisa. Enrico's work ranges widely over many areas of mathematics, from algebra and algebraic geometry to analytic number theory, but it centers on number theory and analysis. In 1974, he was awarded a Fields Medal for his work on the classic mathematical problem of the distribution of prime numbers. In recent years, his work has mainly been concerned with Diophantine approximation and Diophantine geometry, which is concerned with the solution of equations and inequalities using integers. Apart from being one of the world's leading mathematicians, Enrico is a man of many parts, a talented artist and printmaker, a distinguished collector of postage stamps and of seashells. In, fa in fact, every conversation seems to reveal a new hidden talent. But today, his subject is the mathematical infinity. Enrico. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, the subject is a <clears throat> tricky one because, uh, as you may imagine, the concept of, of infinity has been very uh, shifting during the centuries. And uh, the infinity in mathematics also never had a very unique, precise phase. So let me begin. I decided to go a little bit with an historical approach. Uh, of course, uh, uh, s small sections of these lectures could make uh, a semester course in graduate school. So I have to cheat a little bit and select things uh, which attracted my attention. And uh, in many places, I have oversimplified the presentation. So let's move on. The first type of infinity which comes to mind is the infinity of counting. One, two, three, four, and so on. And in this way, in a way that never stops. And uh, the first time I encountered that explicitly in my youth was reading a little book, a po for a popular book, by the physicist George Gamow, and with the title, One, Two, Three, Infinity. So the book uh, was... Um, uh, dealing with mainly with physics, but also with a bit of mathematics and uh, with history, and it was very interesting. Now, the title was in reference how counting, counting may have started. One, two, three, many. Uh, to my surprise, uh, three years ago or two years ago, uh, in an issue of Science News, one of the feature articles uh, explained that there is a tribe that counts in a slightly different way. One, two, three, many was in the book, but in fact, this tribe counts one, two, many. So, one may think how, how far we have moved since then. <laughs> well, psychologists have made studies about our capability of recollect uh, the memory and the, simultaneously. 
of, of various objects. And it turns out that the average person has difficulty in recollecting more than seven. So today we count one, two, three, seven, many. So what are the questions about infinity? Of course, uh, there are many of them. But uh, the first question may be, uh, is the essence of infinity the uncountable, the unmeasurable? Or is infinity is an indication of ultimate perfection? Well, this I, I will leave to the uh, philosophers and theologians, but um, the, my concern will be the infinity in mathematics, and the first question is whether infinity is a part of mathematics. Is infinity a number? Can it be treated as a number? And the answer is, well, it depends on how you do things. So let's move on. So let's start with a little history, early views. Uh, the Greek school, I'll start with the Greeks because there's very little uh, documentation about other periods. Even if we know that in, in, in China, there were uh, quite early, there were um, serious mathematical studies being done. Anyway, with Pythagoras, and the Eleatic school and philosophers like Parmenides and Plato, infinity was accepted as a concept, but with a negative connotation. So, could not be reached, so it was the unreachable. Cannot be described in finite terms, of course. And it was the irrational. And uh, had no form because it could not be increased, could not be decreased. If you divide infinity in two parts, you still get infinity. In fact, one of the axioms is that inf partition the infinity into two parts, one of them will be infinite. And that is, it turns out, is a very tricky axiom, which um, is as plausible as it may look is uh, certainly not a trivial thing. So infinity gave rise to various uh, problems. Uh, the famous uh, paradox of Zeno about the impossibility of movement based on dividing space and time uh, an infinity number of times. And this was not just for fun. I mean, it was... Uh, the way I studied in high school was the concept of things which are indivisible uh, is related to this paradox. Maybe Zeno is precursor of quantization. So what it meant? It meant that unending mathematical constructions were not allowed. Everything had to be done in finite terms. So, about geometry, a straight line was good. What you need to describe a straight line, you need a point and a direction, and then you have a straight line. Just follow the direction. Circle, very good. Again, give the center and the radius, and that determines the circle. Polygons, number of segments, you give the, the beginning and point and, and the directions, and you get polygons. However, uh, the so-called conic sections, ellipses, hyperbolas, parabolas, uh, were not part of plane geometry. So they were not part of the perfect Euclidean plane geometry, and which consisted only of circles and lines. And this because they required uh, constructions in three-dimensional space. So, uh, there was Euclid's geometry is, is as perfect as it may be, it has uh, certain limitations that will not work in, uh, with all the tools of high dimensional space. 
So, but Euclid geometry is very precise with uh, exact axioms and, uh, and uh, constructions which are very elegant and became a symbol of perfection in mathematics. Symbol of rational, uh, rational truth. So uh, this became very important, of course, during the Renaissance and a little later. And so here is a picture of rational truth. This is Raphael, La Scuola di Atene. And it's a fantastic fresco. And Euclid is here in this corner. So here is, uh, you can see measuring something um, and uh, figures, I cannot tell what it looks like triangles, but anyway, that, and the <coughs> this, uh, students around listening to him. So, uh, and here are the two hearers of the rational, rationality, Plato and Aristoteles right there. So that was a way of doing things, but things were not so easy. There were contradictions, and the first contradiction was the discovery of the irrational. And the, the story is told that Pythagoras, who discovered the, the, this problem, uh, kept it secret uh, for, for a very long time, maybe 20 years, uh, because he was afraid of the uh, implications uh, for, the, for his uh, school and so on. Eventually, Pythagoras had to flee <coughs> to, um, to Italy, in fact. So the life of mathematicians there was not necessarily the easiest. So here is the, how the irrational... <coughs> was discovered, if you have a, suppose you have a, uh, a square and the side and the diagonal are in a rational ratio. So it will be a, a ratio m over n with integers m and n. Of course, n is smaller than m. By Pythagoras' theorem, the, the square on the, over the hypotenuse here, okay, this square here, is the sum of two squares over the sides. This one, a square like that, and a square here. And so you have this relation. But mn is integer, 2n squared is even, so m must be even. So m squared is divisible by 4, and you get this equation, and then n squared is twice a square. It's the same equation, but now the numbers are a little smaller. So basically, you start with <coughs> this picture, this triangle, and after this construction, you get this new triangle. This side is half of that side, and <clears throat> uh, the same uh, as that. And uh, the diagonal is the same, of course, as this length. So they have, to, and, and, and are even, so they have to be, again, in the same, <coughs> uh, the sides have to be, again, whole numbers. But just keep repeating, and what you get, you get, uh, uh, starting from a solution, a smaller one, you get an infinite descent of positive integers. That's the, perhaps the first historical uh, example of infinite descent, which was uh, rediscovered and made an, into a powerful tool by Fermat. So let's move on. Now about Euclid. Euclid uh, in Euclid, we find no reference to infinity. Now, it's a popular thing to uh, say that Euclid proved the, that the sequence of prime numbers is infinite. It does not say so. It says the following, that given 
an arbitrary number of primes, there is another prime different from them. And uh, there is very, um, the proof is very classical, and beautiful, very short, but Euclid avoids uh, references of, to infinity. So the, the next, uh, the problem of the uh, square with the duplication of the, <coughs> the area, uh, the diagonal gives you a square with area twice the area of a given square. And you can construct that using the straight edge and compass. And so the problem came out to do it for, for a cube. So we have duplication of a cube. Construct a cube with volume twice the volume of a given cube. Then bisecting an angle is very easy to do again. So what about dividing an angle in three equal parts? and try to give a geometric construction. And then the famous problem of the quadrature of the circle is to give a geometric construction, uh, maybe with straight edge and compass if possible, uh, with the same, uh, of a square with the same area as a given circle. So this means constructing uh, given a unit segment with with geometric, give a pure geometric construction of the square root of the number pi. So, no solution were found with Euclidean geometry, and the first two actually were solved uh, relatively early, uh, in fact, uh, in Greek times, uh, using uh, conic sections. The last problem remains totally inaccessible. And even Dante mentions it, so I couldn't resist to show the reference. So this is the Italian text, and this is the translation. So the geometer tries to square the circle and cannot discover, uh, by thinking, the principle he is in need. So. And the reason of this is that it turns out that Dante was not off the mark in considering the problem very hard because the quadrature of the circle cannot be solved by purely geometric constructions uh, as proved by Lindemann in 1882. Any geometric construction has to be iterated infinite number of times and only then you may be able to do that. So the, these three problems have been a testing ground and uh, for amateur mathematicians, uh, the purpose obviously to satisfy their egos, not, not, not to do anything else. And uh, there are many of, uh, there's a constant flow of false solutions. And uh, there's an edifying account of this subject up to the year 1872 in the book uh, Budget of Paradoxes by Augustus de Morgan, astronomer, royal astronomer and logician. And uh, the, even by now it's well known that these problems are insoluble in uh, say Euclidean geometry certainly and also for the quadrature of the circle with pure geometric construction, the uh, solutions continue. Interestingly enough, uh, the number pi somehow seems to have the uh, way of entering into politics. So around 1890, there was an attempt to introduce uh, the by law that pi was equal 3.2. Uh, and this was done in the Indiana legislature. And this was, fortunately, was promptly killed in the state senate. But 3 over 3.2 is a very bad approximation to pi. <laughs> <laughs> and here is the latest that I could find. It's a good one. Uh, 
let's see. Uh, no, I suppose I, I didn't put in the... Okay. Um, there's one in 1960, the Honorable Daniel Inoue, representative from, representative from Hawaii, well known later as a senator, member of the Watergate Commission. He read into the congressional record of the 86th Congress a long tribute to Maurice Kidgel, Honolulu portrait artist, artist but not only trisected the angle, but also squared the circle and duplicated the cube. He's one of the few people who had a claim to all three. Okay, let's move on. So talking talk about pi, how Archimedes uh, approached the problem of, uh, of pi. He used limiting processes. So he started with approximation like an hexagon, you double the number of sides, this is 12 sides, double again, 24, and it did that, uh, obtain uh, 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 96 sides. The point is that this construction can be done uh, with ruler and compass, the doubling of the sides, and it is possible to obtain what today will be formulas and Archimedes was, did not have the algebra, tool of algebra at his disposal, but he did manage to obtain approximations, these two approximations, which are very, very good, actually. And in modern terms, the pi is between these two numbers. These are, can be described what, what Archimedes, Archimedes was doing. Okay, so let's <clears throat> look at another thing, the question of big numbers. Big numbers, of course, are finite. They are numbers, but they, they may be an approximation, in a sense, to infinity if they are big enough. So again, I would remain with Archimedes. I'll say a couple of things about the cattle problem. And appears in a, in a Greek epigram discovered in 1773 or so, and consists in finding the composition of the herd of the sun, uh, the number of cows and bulls uh, with certain, with white, black, spotted, and, uh, and these numbers, however, there are some relations which I'm not going to write down. And this, this is attributed to Archimedes, but obviously the concept is much older because the Odyssey is supposed to be, what, uh, maybe 800 BC or something like that. So, little problem. The number of white bulls in, in the smallest solution is 206,545 digits. Certainly, Archimedes could not write down the solutions. So, was this an Archimedes problem? Uh, perhaps not. Uh, there is an interesting, or maybe yes, there is an interesting discovery recently of a palimpsest. Uh, so, it's a book, uh, manuscript has been written over another manuscript. And under the text, there is uh, one of the books of Archimedes called the Spirals. And uh, the new techniques in uh, uh, like infrared photography and I don't know what, but I mean, unbelievable things, they have been able now to read the text underneath. And they find the story, Archimedes tells a story. He was in the habit of corresponding with the mathematicians in Alexandria and informed them of his, his own discoveries. And then he found out that some of those mathematicians in Alexandria were using, were claiming as their own discoveries what were 
really Archimedes' discoveries. So, um, then he says that in the last letter he sent to them, he put two theorems which were false <laughs> with the purpose of unmasking <laughs> the culprits. <laughs> so, that's already big. But Archimedes obviously was not satisfied with this. And then he said to, uh, at the time, was considered just impossible thing, count the number of grains of sands, uh, <coughs> grains of sand in the universe, in the book Semitas. So, he had to invent a new number system, because the ordinary number system could not, you could not write, and it's similar to the uh, exponential notation used today. And this count is Ten, about 10 followed by 63 zeros. Oh, that's an interesting one. So Archimedes was not afraid of tackling the infinity of extraordinarily large numbers. So what is the mathematical infinity? We have two views. Aristotle's view is very interesting, and uh, infinity is a potential thing which is a substitute for, to indicate uh, finite quantities, but as large as needed. Constructions, finite, but repeat as many times as needed. So that's his concept of infinity. Archimedes was more uh, pragmatist, and in fact he uh, basically uh, he accepted the concept of limit which he used to study the distribution of um, um, distribution of, I mean, the, the compute the area of the parabola and uh, the area of the sphere and the cylinder and things like that. So the conclusion is how we do things today. Well, we want to know things, and if we can do it, fine. And Actually, I say how it is obtained is very important and takes second stage. Well, there's, of course, we, we are not supposed to steal results from other, for your, from your colleagues. So, now I want to explain a little story about uh, very large numbers. So, reaching infinity. Friends and strangers. Given any size n in any part of sufficiently large size, and then it's R and n is the there are two n's because there are variants which require different numbers. We can find either subset of n people who know each other, I'll call it a clique or a mafia if you want, or a subset of n people who never met before, the strangers. So, friends and strangers. So, how many, how big must be the size of the party to guarantee that either you find a set of n strangers or a set of, uh, or a clique of n, of n people? Well, with, with three, this is a proof that, oops, uh, with three is at least six. You have five people, and the one in red is a, fr a friend. It's a warm color, they're a friend, of course. Cool color, they never met before. So. And there are no triangles, no blue triangles and no red triangles. So, uh, it has to be at least six, and it's very easy to show it's six. Well, for four is 18, this number. For five, between 43 and 49, and so on. Now we say, what was, was the problem with this thing? Are they big numbers? No. But it, they are extraordinarily difficult to compute. Now, here is a picture of what happens. When you put more and more vertices and try to get the color, some colors, uh, here you see, for example, a triangle. 
the possibilities of doing that, they grow really at a fantastic rate. So, the <coughs> uh, these numbers uh, are quite so far, you cannot do just by enumerating all the possibilities. So here is a generalization, which I leave for the mathematicians, but essentially says uh, there are more than two colors, maybe three, four, five, whatever, and give a size. Now, all these subsets of a given size, you want to uh, to give the same color. We want to find the subset so that all the subsets of the same size have the same color. And this you can do, as a famous theorem of Ramsey in uh, combinatorics. And there's a little variant. You want to just uh, innocuous condition that the minimum element in the set S is greater, is smaller than the number of elements in S. Well, what happens? The Ramsey theorem is provable in what is called piano arithmetic, which is a model, a simple model of arithmetic which corresponds to our intuition. The paris harrington theorem is true, but it's not provable in piano arithmetic. It's provable in a, what is called zermelo frankel uh, set, uh, set theory. And the reason the proof requires an induction, which is not the usual induction going from one spot to the next. It's an induction which branches at every, at every time. So it's uh, to do that, one has to really to go to infinity and a kind of infinity which is much more complicated than the counting one, two, three, and so on. So, here, the, to understand the Ramsey number, here, how Erdos, a famous Hungarian mathematician, described the situation. Imagine an alien force, vastly more powerful than us, landing on Earth and demanding the value of R55, or they will destroy our planet. In that case, we should marshal all computers, all mathematicians attempt to find the value. We may or may not, but we should try. But suppose instead they ask for six, we should attempt to destroy the aliens, <laughs> even if they're vastly more powerful than us. Because So the situation for the paris harrington result is worse. A good description is the problem is like the Hydra monster. The Hydra monster had nine heads. One was immortal. And if you, at least in some versions, if you cut one head, two heads will sprout. So, uh, well, Hercules was a smart guy, so he did find a way of destroying the Hydra. But anyway, the Paris Harrington problem is a bit like killing the Hydra because the examination of, of each case um, gives rise to more cases, more, many more subcases, and so on. And those who get more subcases and more subcases, and how you do that, it's, uh, you never finish. So here is the thing. Here is uh, Heracles. The, the strong guy, you see, uh, very good muscles. And this is his friend, Iolaus, who will accompany him in his uh, tireless things. He is the Hydra with nine heads. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. I got the picture from the Getty Museum. Okay, so this is what we do for. So, enough for the classic uh, things. Already seen that there are even the small numbers like this Ramsey numbers which are extraordinarily difficult to compute uh, even if they are small. And so let's move on on 
what I call shifting views of infinity. And basically, it's uh, the notion of limit, really, which was Archimedes had used one way or in some definite fashion, not necessarily in a formal way, it was only much later in the 17th century that with uh, Cavalieri and Torricelli in Italy and in France with Descartes and Fermat, and then the invention of calculus by Leibniz, uh, and also I should mention Newton. Uh, I will not go into the dispute who did it and uh, who was first. So, but the question is, what is an infinitesimal? The integral is a continuous sum of infinitesimal. Does it make sense? Can we treat infinitesimal as if they were numbers? And basically there was no agreement. Then you start doing, mathematicians started playing with infinite and there's a series like that. What is the value? Can you assign a value to that? And well, they say one, if I take out one, I get zero, then I get one, zero, one, zero. Oh, I just do a Solomonic thing, I take the average, I say it's one half. Well, but if I put some actually zeros in between, like there and there and so on, the, the sum will be one third according to those rules. And that is what all the disputes were, came up. And it was only at the end of the 19th century that Cesaro introduced, uh, formalized this approach to get the sum of strange infinite sums like that in what it was called, was defined as a summability method. <coughs> And uh, now some ability techniques are used everywhere and accepted in mathematics. I want to say a couple of things, but not want to stay long on this because the time goes by. So Euler, uh, I, I had to mention Euler prime numbers. One, because Euler is perhaps my favorite mathematician. And primes, because I have a very partial feeling toward prime numbers. So, uh, Euler starts with this equation, which formally expresses the fact that an integer, any integer, is expressible in a unique way as a product of prime numbers. It's a way of writing that. And then he goes to the limit, however, for s equal going to 1, and writes this equation. I say it's meaningless because the left-hand side was very well known that diverges and the sum is infinity. But Euler deduces then that if the, if the number of primes, there were only finitely many primes, this will be a number. But this is infinity, so there have to be infinitely many primes. And then he says that he writes that the sum of the reciprocal of the primes is the double logarithm of infinity. What did he have in mind? So, the idea is, uh, this is what Euler was doing all the time, was using like a geometric series when x is less than one, so he can give a sum, it's, uh, this value. And when x goes to 1, you get 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, and so on. Take the logarithm of that, and you can compute the logarithm explicitly, it's this gadget. So when I put x equal 1, if 1 over 0 is my infinity here, then I write some 1 over n is the log of infinity. Now I take another log, but the sum of 1 over n, let's go back a moment, is, the, is this product, the log of product is the sum. And it's easy to see that the log of this number is essentially very close to one over p. So I take the log of that and I get Euler's statement. Now, to
today, this mathematics will be considered not rigorous, but it's pretty easy to justify things and obtain, <coughs> obtain what we want. So slowly, we go to the point of accepting the concept of infinity. And here, I have to make a, a quantum jump because it, at this moment, there, there, uh, there was a revolution in mathematics which comes with set theory. This is a portrait of the philosopher Bernard Bolzano and is the first one to really to consider uh, precisely a concept of set. A set, a mathematical set, you may think of being as an aggregate of objects without any ordering. That's the, the thing which was confusing in the past, before him. And then Cantor uh, studied, uh, used the, the um, set, uh, the theory of sets to study the notions of infinity and uh, the, the, the right aleph zero for the infinity from this county, one, two, three, infinity, and Cantor will write aleph zero. And Cantor introduced a concept called cardinality, which essentially measures how many elements there are in a set. So uh, my lecture contains as a cardinality of 33, 33 full slides. Okay. And <clears throat> all right. So two sets have the same cardinality if they can put in one-to-one -one correspondence. The simple, the integers, natural integers, have the same cardinality as the even integers. Just multiply by two, you get that. Divide by two, you get the other one. So you get what is called one-to-one -one correspondence. However, Canton discovered that there must be some other notion, some, some infinity which is bigger than the aleph zero. And this is famous diagonal argument. Suppose I can count all the decimal numbers like that. So put them in a list. And then take the diagonal. So I'll start zero, then what, six, zero, zero, nine, five, and so on. Now, if I take a number with no digit equal to the corresponding digit in the diagonal, then this number cannot be present in the list, which means the decimal numbers, or if you want uh, the, uh, an interval, cannot be counted. So that was really a big revolution. However, there were difficulties. Here is one of them. This, this is interesting also for a um, historical point of view. Uh, the German logician, logician Frege was <coughs> had just finished correcting the second proofs of his magnum opus um, on, on logic and foundations of mathematics when he received a letter by Russell. And the letter asked, how do you deal with, with this problem? And basically with that, those two lines, two, four lines, he destroyed the foundation of Frege's uh, work. So how do you solve these things? Well, there are various ways. Solution one, axiomatic set theory, and that means imposing restrictions, called axioms, on the definition of a set. Uh, basically, some of these uh, 
problems arise, for example, to, to, from a phrase like the set of all sets. And then uh, with, with that, you, you run into trouble very quickly. So, that's one. Two, well, taking the Aristotelian solution, only finite objects, precise rules of inference are allowed. Solution three, just stay with the very basic things. Intuition is a mathematical object does not exist until it's been constructed. Well, all this is fine, but uh, probably intuition is, uh, which is rather interesting to see the limit, limit, uh, how far you can go uh, if you put, uh, you know, if you try to stay according to this philosophy. Uh, and the answer is not very far, really. And so intuition is, is mainly for the logicians. And then there is another solution, universes. That sets can be only subsets of a universe sufficiently big where one can do all thinkable mathematics. And that is a very pleasing solution. Now, how do we find a universe? The answer is, well, you cannot find from, from Zermelo Frankel axioms. You have to, to put new axioms, which in this type of theory is the existence of strongly inaccessible cardinals. Uh, we'll not uh, explain what they are, but basically <clears throat> uh, you may assume that they are, they are, yeah, they are at your disposal, but you will get a different universe if you change it to inaccessible large cardinal. The strongly inaccessible cardinal, you change that, you get a different universe. So again, suddenly mathematics is not only one way of doing mathematics, but many other things. So uh, I will skip this one. Only, I will say only thing about the, the continuum the the uh, the, <clears throat> the question is whether the continuum is equal to the first cardinal larger than the counting one two three and uh, Cantor proposed the continuum hypothesis and uh, by the way in the misnomer that the continuum hypothesis the continuum is is, is this quantity is uh, that's totally wrong. The continuum is that quantity. <laughs> so the, the question is: Is there an uh, uncountable cardinal which is below that, in between? The, the turns, turns out the continuum hypothesis is independent of the standard Zermelo-Frankel <coughs> uh, theory. And you can accept it and reject and get two different kinds of mathematics, uh, both equally valid, assuming that, of course, the, the thing you start with, that this theory is valid. That's remarkable. So now I want to continue with the story of the busy beaver. Now I'm going to go back from the infinity to actual numbers. Sort of. So the busy beaver usually stands for a person. You say that person is a busy beaver means it works tirelessly until the task is finished. Uh, well, just in case you might think it's something else, here is the busy beaver. <laughs> Building, that's the task, right? Building a dam like that. And there is. So, the story of the busy beaver is actually comes with the Turing machine. So a Turing machine is a kind of very primitive computer, which uh, actually is as powerful as the most powerful computer you can imagine. 
So the fight is very primitive, has the advantage, then you can analyze the weight functions in an easier fashion. So how what is described as follows. There is a tape, think of that as being a kind of memory, infinite in both directions, so you have no, no question how far you can go. Tape head here, for read, read, uh, read and write. Two symbols, here uh, there are A and B, but it could be one and zero, and I'll call them a bit. And states of the machine. An instruction how to move from a state S and reading the bit B. Uh, instruction what to do when, when at a given moment you, have, you are in a state S and the bit you read is this bit. And then you want a halting state which tells the machine to stop. Well, I have to tell you what, are, what is an instruction. An instruction consists of state, new state, new state here, um, which may be the same. They don't, don't have to change. I mean, a symbol, so a bit, which may be the same, may change. This to write on the current tape location. So once you have the instruction tells you here, you print something. And then you have a shift, right or left, only one step, so you move either here or there. And then you have a program. The computer program will be, you start with a tape of symbol, like, like that. When you state S, read the symbol. Then, according to the instruction, if it tells you to stop, you stop. And otherwise, <coughs> you move, change the state to the new state, you write the new a bit on the same location, and then you move the tape, one step, to right, right, and left, and continue. So any computer and any program can be emulated by such a machine. Of course, it may take, uh, it's not a practical thing to do, but uh, for theoretical analysis, it is. So let's continue with, with our beaver. The beaver is, uh, <coughs> Uh, Turing machine with end states, and if it never stops working, they say it's foolish beaver. If it holds, there's a champion beaver which creates the biggest dam, of, and so has the largest number of ones on the tape, and call it a busy beaver. And say BN is the number of ones at the end of the work of the busy beaver. This function is not computable by any Turing machine. No Turing machine can, can compute this number for every n. Now, there is every indication that our brain also works like a Turing machine, because our logical inferences, you, you get something, and then from there you make the next one, and the next one, and so on. So, basically, these numbers, if they are computable at all, you can compute only one at a time. So the first four numbers are known. Uh, the sixth number, well, is at least 129 followed by 863 zeros and could be a lot bigger. There are over 63 trillion machines with two symbols and five states. And, and the programs, however, is only 10, 10 instructions. So you have very simple uh, systems which have a very complex behavior. And <coughs> I'll just show you for fun the third busy beaver is this one. And the start, I'll just show the first step. Start and state A and zero here. So what it tells, uh, I have to print a one in that location, change to state, to state B, uh, <coughs> move to the right, R, and change to state B. And then you continue, and it does that, 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 that. This is the location of the, of the head on the tape. And uh, 
and here it calls. So, okay, here we are. So, the um, So this is an example of something which is finite but uncomputable. But there is another more subtle concept of finite. So the finite reachable, it's let's say in real time by computing machine, and the finite which is unreachable because the running time cannot be less say than the age of the universe. So for me, uh, silly, it's not useful. Um, factorization may be one of these things, but I, by the way, I don't think so. And uh, in quantum computing, actually, you can do factorization. So, except we don't have a quantum computer yet. It's only in our minds. Anyway, the multiplication of two numbers can be done in steps, like uh, quickly. So it means if I give you the factorization, you can check it very quickly. But factorizing, finding the solution is hard. So you say that uh, things which behave in a sense like multiplication, say it's polynomial complexity, and they're soluble in, in polynomial time, here. And the class of problems solvable in non-deterministic polynomial time, which means you need the, some guy who tells you the solution, and then you can check quickly. That you call non-deterministic polynomial is another class, obviously, uh, maybe bigger than that. And the big discovery is the, there are polynomials uh, problems that are NP complete, which means every problem in NP can be reduced to that particular problem quickly. What does it mean? Now the question is, it means that if you, one of these problems, NP uh, complete is polynomial, then everything in NP is polynomial because you can reduce to that problem and then solve it. So th this is the main question. Is P equal to NP? Well, if you solve this question, you will get one million dollars from the Clay Foundation. And it has become a really fantastic source uh, for uh, understanding the, the structure of these things. So, by now, thousands of problems have been shown to be NP-complete. Not a single one has been shown that is not in P. So, the problem is open. Maybe to solve it, we'll have to go somewhere in it. Abandon the finite model and go into infinity, perhaps, who knows. And also, I've seen the uncomputable, like the busy beaver. And then the computer, so silly, I've shown that even the finite is, there are two types the one which, in a sense, is comparable to real life and the one which is beyond the grasp of even our imagination. And I'll conclude here. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. First of all, it's historical that um, factoring was purely exponential for a long time, 
Then uh, techniques like uh, mm, continued fraction factorization, elliptic curve factorization, and so on. The, the exponential was <coughs> not the, you know, instead of exponential of x, was exponential of square root x. Then with the number field, <coughs> save, and uh, <coughs> factoring, the cube, uh, the square root of x became the cube root, with little adjustments, which are not, not important. And if you think a moment, uh, the reason for that, the success, is because uh, basically to reduce the size of the things to, to work. It's not inconceivable that by doing a um, chain of algebraic extensions, that thing can be uh, reduced further. So we'll see. <laughs> So the question is uh, whether the notion of, if I understand correctly, notion of polynomial complexity is relevant to the P and P problem. Uh, well, in a sense, uh, the, first of all, the polynomial complexity, which looks like a strange uh, um, notion, somewhat arbitrary, why not replace the polynomial with something which grows faster than a polynomial? The answer is the uh, polynomial complexity uh, is uh, the functions of which have polynomial complexity are precisely the so-called recursive functions in the simplest model of arithmetic, which you think of it as being uh, piano arithmetic without the induction. In fact, it's a little simpler, I'm oversimplifying a little, but it's uh, it's a class of recursive functions. So as such, it's like a Turing machine which works, however, with certain type of restrictions. And <coughs> uh, so it's a natural, very natural thing. And the, the implication, I mean, is uh, more that things of this type may be relevant to the understanding of the problem. On the other hand, uh, the getting lower bound for the complexity of programs of specific things has been extraordinarily difficult. And uh, now I understand that uh, Standard techniques, for example, cannot even approach the problem of P and NP. So, so a little, uh, the, the polynomial complexity is the simplest uh, notion of finite one can have. And it's a, it turns out to be a very natural one. Thank you very much for your fascinating talk.